And now, welcome to the Cyber Policy Governance and Risk Management Panel. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the head of the International Telecommunications Union Office for Europe, Mr. Yaroslav Ponder. The executive producer at Cyber Policy Institute, Ms. Anakin Tick. The European Union expert within cybersecurity project, Mr. Mihai Dantzic. Project coordinator at Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance, Ms. Franziska Klopfer. The security consultant at the European Parliament, Mr. Radu Stanescu. The moderator of this panel, president of the Center for Conflict Prevention and Early Warning, Mr. Julian Kifu. Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome to this uh, panel that is supposed to be a very vivid one. We have uh, roughly until 11.30 for respect for our other participants, and we have to move on quite quickly. It is uh, uh, an honor to be here, and we have a wonderful panel. You already saw the presentation. Five very knowledgeable people to learn from them and on cybersecurity ecosystem, on cyber resilience, how to build trust and collaboration by knowledge exchange, challenges and good practices, building an efficient cyber technology and in detail. So actually, quite uh, quite quite a challenge for all of us. Um, and. At the center, we have the strategic resilience. Resilience being now the world of the work of the of the year after the coronavirus crisis. It means uh, at the same time cooperation between the state, society, and citizens. At the same time, it is um, mandatory if we want to tackle hybrid threats, terrorism, and for sure, cyber defense. And we already passed via three generations of uh, of, of cyber defenses of cyber resilience. Stability and prevention was the first one. Proactive action and early warning, the second one. Dynamic adaptability and reforming during crisis, the third one. Without other further ado, I will invite Mr. Yaroslav Onder, to, who is the, the head of the IDU, you already saw the presentation, to introduce us in the a number of tools and objectives uh, in, in order to see how and for sure about the impact of your organization, how it will help cyber resilience of the states and how it works in terms of cooperation. So, uh, Mr. Ponder, you have the floor. Thank you very much and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure uh, to be with, uh, with all of you. Uh, and as already, our Deputy Secretary General stated uh, we are very much committed to strengthening the capacities and capabilities uh, of the cybersecurity infrastructure across the region but also at the global level at the regional level we are guided by the member states voice uh, which uh, sets the milestones and um, requests for the concrete set of actions uh, to be um, to come from the international organization from the UN organization in charge of the ICTs, uh, which is the ITU. Uh, and this brings me to uh, the follow-up to the World Summit on the Information and Society Resolves, which set up uh, not only uh, the good understanding what the ITU should be doing, but also uh, triggered quite good um, discussion among the all stakeholders and through the multi-stakeholder um, mechanism set up the global cybersecurity agenda, which up to today is providing us the guidance and the framework for setting uh, the concrete actions at the regional and the national uh, level. But of course, in order to make um, this happen, uh, important thing is to understand the context and how uh, the countries are performing. Uh, of course, in the international community, we don't like to rank the uh, countries uh, because everybody is doing well. Uh, of course, the question is, can they do better? And this is the reason why also in the consultations with the, all our members, uh, we were able to uh, set up 
and the tool which is very helpful in terms of taking a look at the level of the commitment of the governments and towards the cyber security. Uh, so on the annual basis, we are taking a look through the Global Cybersecurity Index, uh, what are the main trends uh, and uh, how far uh, the countries are doing well in different uh, domains, in the technical and the legal capacity building uh, and uh, the others, making sure and that those areas which are still need uh, some, uh, some support uh, and improvement and they can be addressed uh, or at the national level or with the support of the regional uh, or international uh, organization. Of course, as you, um, as you know, and it's uh, difficult to, uh, to, dis uh, to, to deny, uh, Europe is very diversified in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the commitment to the cybersecurity. The good thing today is that at the legal level we have a significant and progress in terms of the harmonization of the uh, legal approaches. Um, however, uh, still some work has to be uh, done. Uh, and this is also the reason uh, why we are supporting the countries in uh, development of their national strategies uh, for the cybersecurity, making sure that not only the legal basis is in place, but also it's backed up by the uh, strategic uh, guidance of the government. Um, and the public sector and to support the implementation at the national uh, level. Uh, so, of course, it's not a surprise uh, that uh, some of the countries uh, are, um, have uh, succeeded to uh, arrive to the um, 10 of the world, uh, including UK, France, Lithuania, Estonia, Spain, Norway, uh, but also uh, the others are getting uh, there. Um, this commitment of the governments to the fate of the improving uh, security and confidence in use of the ICTs wins a special importance in the times of the COVID. As we already heard uh, in the previous um, introductory speech uh, of our colleagues from the industry, uh, we observe significant increase uh, of um, misbehavior in the cyberspace, which requires uh, our um, our action. And this is the reason why also in the ITU uh, we have uh, dedicated special efforts since one year um, to reinforce uh, special efforts since one year to address the needs of the vulnerable groups which are the most uh, affected um, by uh, the, these pandemics. Not being first uh, exposed to the digital technologies and digital space and becoming the fresh new user uh, become uh, very um, easy and to be attacked uh, and, and to be a victim of the bad side uh, of the cybersecurity and these behaviors of some stakeholders. But uh, I will come back so, uh, to this uh, uh, just in the second it's about It's about norms, it's about uh, uh, regulations, and it's about the support for the vulnerables. How it ha how how it works uh, uh, your organization how it works in that area? Absolutely. Um, so in this sense, uh, we focus. Uh, we have the two streams of the support to the countries. We're building the capacities uh, in terms of the strengthening capabilities of the certs and making sure that uh, the teams are properly equipped, uh, but also technically. Um, they are uh, getting uh, the, the best possible knowledge. Um, and this is the reason why the annual uh, global um, cyber drills are the mechanisms to uh, provide not only the capacity building opportunity, but also the possibility of linking the different teams together and to act together uh, against the cyber uh, threats. We hope the next year they will be able to meet uh, at the regional cyber drill uh, in North Macedonia. If not, uh, we'll be continuing our journey in the virtual mode uh, through the global cybersecurity uh, uh, exercise. We're also supporting the countries in establishment of the certs, uh, governmental certs, but also the national certs. And as we know, uh, and from our research uh, comes, um, there are still some countries uh, which still um, 
require the support in terms of the setting up these infrastructures and putting them in the uh, proper uh, regional and global uh, context. Uh, on the other hand, we are also focusing on the vulnerable uh, groups, as I mentioned. Uh, and um, the first one e are the children. During the COVID, uh, over one billion children were disconnected from the uh, schooling. So a lot of governments and a lot of organizations made necessary in order to bring these fresh users to the internet, which became the very easy victims of any kind of the um, malicious um, actions in the internet. Uh, and this is the reason why immediately in June, we have launched also the global um, child owner protection guidelines, uh, which currently we are rolling out at the um, country level. And we are pleased uh, to see that in Europe, um, we have very good response of the governments and also the other stakeholders and to make the progress uh, in this. This is not only the set of the papers, but this is the full mechanism ensuring that the national uh, activities in field of the child owner protection, youth online protection, um, uh, find uh, the reflection in the national action, not only by some stakeholders, but by all those who have to act together at the national level. And this includes educators, parents, government, industry, um, and uh, the, uh, the others. Uh, so this is the reason why um, we we find currently uh, necessary uh, to see how also the national strategies for the child owner protection and national approaches for the um, for addressing those um, urgent needs of uh, of action uh, are constructed. Uh, we are we are supporting the countries in this endeavor, providing the national assessment and setting up the proper institutional uh, frameworks in order to have the proper response and the support uh, to uh, the children. It's not the easy way. Uh, very often the child owner protection is distributed uh, among different public institutions uh, and, and requires also the political uh, coordination at the national level in order to find a proper uh, legal framework as the reference point, um, and but also the proper understanding um, of uh, some national uh, activities to happen and to be supported by the uh, by the government and the public sector and the other stakeholders. Uh, so therefore, uh, we also uh, kindly invite. Um, we are currently working um, on the daily basis with uh, over 16 countries. Uh, in Europe, out of the 46, um, we are inviting uh, other countries uh, to join the forces and to make sure that uh, the material is available in the national language and that the materials are mainstreamed through the existing uh, educational uh, mechanism, but also um, uh, also um, uh, the new uh, Yaroslav, offerings. Can we, uh, are can we move on? Thank you very much. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay, so we have here lessons learned and good practices and a, a good way of cooperation at the international level, European level in that case, and it, it, it makes sense. So I will move to Anakin, trying to, to ask you what is uh, the part that we can share at the international level, what is the, the part of the cooperation, and what we solved at the national level, because I'm sure at least in the in the cyber defense, except for good practices and our partners and allies, uh, there are things that should be kept at the national level. And again, please. Thank you very much. Um, well, I, I'd say that the, for me, the, the main difference uh, of focus between national and international level is being able to discern what is in perceivably in common interest. That means where we can convince the world to act together, uh, given that we have uh, political differences, different cap cap capabilities, different capacity. And there, so sort of to look for this common nominator that I think uh, Yaroslav uh, uh, nicely, nicely showed how it happens in the ITU context. And then uh, at national level, to, the question really becomes 
to focus on nat national aspirations in a way not to put icts first but put national development and uh, and uh, policy goals first uh, understanding of the society where it, where it where it wants to go and then how to harness icts uh, to to achieve that so so in a way it becomes this uh, system where nations can based on their unique experience unique understanding of for example gaps in the international community or their own strengths or weaknesses uh, their own best practices uh, take lead in national international processes on the other hand take that international uh, guidance or or discussions back to their national level so it's it's a perfect synergy the way i see it okay and uh, about cyber resilience cyber resilience is the is uh, actually and resilience as a whole is the concept of the year 2020 uh, in the number of uh, of uh, hits and the number of uh, googles whatever but uh, the substance of the concept is quite different we have some definitions we have a resilience at the level of the european union how would you look at the concept and how would you frame it well, again, you are very right to point out that uh, there are many ways to define resilience. Um, I'd say, given how much maybe we have been fixated on, on deterrence when it comes to, to cyber affairs, and uh, both national and international, the, the most essential thing is to get the concept or the main uh, focus of, of resilience, which I would describe it as the capacity and capability to sustain national interests and activities online. So, so the question there here is not how we respond to a bad uh, incident uh, that happens to us, but how do we understand our, again, those national aspirations, our particular connectivity, online services, our user population in this uh, context of ICTs, and then how we can um, anticipate those threats, uh, risks affecting us, acknowledge them and optimally mitigate them uh, beforehand. And, and that doesn't have to be only technical resilience, we, we, need, we need to think about resilience in societal, legal, political terms. That is how different disciplines, different functions of, of both the, at government level in the industry, in academia, can come together and, and optimally contribute their capacity, their skills, their preparedness to this, uh, well, depending on how we look at resilience, international resilience or national resilience. And... Uh, being able to trust our own um, being and activities uh, in this ICT environment. Or, or the society as a whole, communities and the citizen deserves a lot of trust and here the breaches of trust or the abuse of power is always playing in the in the bat of, of the game and for sure it's another point that you raised Abby, is the fact that international cooperation actually is based on the national achievements because we can't have as Yaroslav earlier pointed out uh, the the uh, lessons learned and good practices if we don't have these developments at the national level i will move a little bit because we have the Yaroslav talking about the european union maybe you can focus a little bit on the un what un has done this year, what we would expect next year, maybe in that particular field, to, it's the, the, the global organization that we have in hand, multinational organization. What should we expect from the UN? What has been done? Well, this, of course, would be a fair, fair topic for, for a lecture, but um, I would just offer a couple of highlights. Um, First, that despite the differences, uh, the, the strong, uh, clearly identifiable political differences, different operational interests, uh, different uh, capacity, states have been able to maintain the dialogue in, uh, in, the, in the UN First Committee, in the UN Group of uh, Governmental Experts, and even expanded the dialogue to an di international conversation in the open-ended working group. And not only that, uh, there are more activi activities and initiatives in the UN that, that I think take this issue more and more out of this uh, 
emphasis on arms control and more towards this understanding that it's part of uh, sustainable development. It's it's how we cooperate. It's how we how we resolve peacefully our differences. And so, I would call this uh, 2015 UNGG report that has later been endorsed by by other not just UN formats but uh, I'd say that uh, governments across the world that gives governments this basic guidance of an ideal world of things that we wouldn't do uh, uh, and that the governments need to direct their attention to and those are broadly international cooperation assistance to each other uh, uh, respect for human rights online uh, Guaranteeing the inviolability and, and independence of these first response capability, capacity and, and uh, groups and, and many others, that, that these recommendations uh, have been coming from a group of states and uh, experts that uh, otherwise uh, may be very, very differently uh, opinionated or view, viewing uh, these uh, developments of, in terms of ICTs. So what do you expect? Um, I would say I would I would not expect too much from diplomacy in a situation where the cyber issues cannot be separated from broader and then bigger world issues, but uh, but it's definitely good that the conversation continues. That's uh, that's the best we can hope for, or like the, the the least we can hope for. Sorry, but then this more focus on resilience, this more focus on on actually what these other. Um, stakeholders other than governments can bring to discussion that the governments are having about this the potential in a way that we have in our technical uh, community in in the private sector and how to integrate that into the implementation of these recommendations so if i understood correctly you are looking at the cyber as a service as a tool as an instrument but also you can look at it as a weapon. So you have the control of the weapons and you have the respect of the rights of those who are involved uh, uh, into these targets, if it's the case. I will move to Francisca. So uh, we've heard a lot about uh, uh, cyber resilience and that's the subject of the day. How, what, what steps would you, would you take and a country would, should take in order to, to reach uh, a level of resilience that is, let's say, decent and, and aim at, at ensuring the security, the cybersecurity of a country. Okay. <clears throat> thank you very much, Julian. Um, um, and, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this uh, very interesting event. So, um, I come from an organization that uh, looks into good governance in the security sector. So what we are working on in, in cybersecurity is also <clears throat> how can um, uh, governments best design their policies. And in cybersecurity, and especially as it terms, uh, comes to resilience, a lot of it was already said by Yaroslav and Eneken, and I just want to structure it maybe in some practical steps then, um, because we also do a lot of um, give advice to governments. And what we always do as well is, um, we start you know, with an assessment, and I think uh, that's you know, really one of the first steps that uh, the government would have to do, uh, assessing especially um, the stakeholders, having a map of who the stakeholders are, and then working with these stakeholders on assessing you know, uh, vulnerabilities. And, and in, in, in that um, context, I think it's also really important to, um, as, uh, as it was already said before, um, work on <clears throat> this, um, um, looking into really what the, the, the security needs are of um, the different stakeholders and therefore uh, uh, integrate that in, in, into your planning. Um, what is also an important next step is really to defining the levels of resilience that you are um, expecting, because only if you know uh, what kind of level of ex uh, resilience you expect of different sectors, then you can, you know, test whether they are actually um, or remeeting this level or what they still need to do to uh, meet this le level. Um, I think um, what is very important um, in this context as well is that um, the process doesn't work if there's not a cooperation, as we already you know, mentioned several times today, um, that uh, there's a need for an openness and for actors to work together. Um, and especially when you look into <clears throat> solutions for you know, building up resilience, you have to 
uh, see how the different stakeholders from public and private sector can work together. And you have to come uh, as a government provide um, an environment where you have a cybersecurity community that is open and cooperative and you build the right kind of frameworks where these actors can meet. Um, I just want to finish by, by picking up on, on what was said earlier about this um, uh, terminology of resilience and I agree um, very much. I think it's a, a very good, um, I, I like the term resilience. Um, uh, what I think is important, and I, there, there I just um, 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 repeat also what was said by Anakin, um, if we move to resilience, we have to be very also clear um, that we uh, do not forget about whose resilience we're, we're thinking about. Um, in in, in, in DCAF and my organizations, when we talk about security, we always say we don't only talk about state security, we also talk about human security. So in the same sense, also with resilience, we really have to look at the, you know, um, uh, the, the resilience, the needs for resilience, not just of, you know, technical, but also for the state and, as Anakin said, political, so threats to political stability. Um, but also really start your deliberations by looking at who are the different parts in society. And as the others have mentioned, one of them, for example, very vulnerable are children, but there are other vulnerable groups. So, um, um, uh, really all of this process of planning resilience um, of, a, of a country, really that, that has to start with a real assessment about uh, what are the needs of the security uh, of every uh, you know, member of society, of every group that we can find in society, as well as the state as a whole. From the Western Balkans, I know that you know very well this region. Uh, in in this uh, field in the cyber resilience. Um, sorry, I didn't get the first part of your question. <clears throat> well, I was asking you to give us some practical uh, added value, some uh, lessons learned and good practices from the Western Balkans region that you know very well. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, there, um, I think um, I, I want to pick up on this. Um, community building that um, I have just mentioned, you know, the importance of um, really uh, building a cybersecurity community. And then the work that we have done a lot um, uh, in the countries is uh, sitting down, really bringing together stakeholders. Um, and the very first start is often, you know, just for stakeholders to meet each other. Uh, for those from the government um, to, to know, you know, who are working in the private sector, what are they doing? Even sometimes people from government and government to know each other, because that's not always the case. And um, 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 to, first of all, you know, have an awareness how who is there, what are their roles, and how, you know, how could we possibly cooperate? What are, are our um, common objectives? Um, and again, to speak practically, um, what we found in this work is the key is um, that in this process, you really focus on building trust. Because as I said, uh, when stakeholders work together, there has to be an openness. There has to be uh, both in terms of minds, but also in terms of possibilities to cooperate. Because often there's mistrust. Um, um, I think um, this is something we, we saw in the Western Balkans. Um, uh, I don't know how the situation is in Moldova, but usually stakeholders are not used to working together yet. So um, there, there is a lot of, you know, of work that has to be done before a community really can function. Um, so this building of trust and the stakeholder awareness uh, can be done very nicely through um, activities such as, for example, um, a joint um, uh, joint informal meetings, first of all, where you talk about topics which are not controversial. Uh, then through tabletop exercises, uh, exercises where you simulate, for example, uh, an incident, and then you see how could we be working together if that was happening, and you see, okay, this is what works, this is what doesn't work. These are um, um, maybe the kind of um, procedures that we still need to set in place. This is the new actors that we have to um, bring in. Um, what is also okay, very important thank you very much that, yeah thank you very much francesca yes sir. thank you for for opening the floor for these concrete experiences uh, and i will move a little bit to 
uh, the very practical part, uh, and we have, uh, since you talked about the Republic of Moldova, uh, we, and, and, uh, uh, and we have Radu, who is going to tell us, I think, some uh, issues related to, uh, to risk management, but especially uh, where are we today with uh, uh, the maturity of cybersecurity in companies? And I will arrive late to, to Mihai, who is going to focus on Republic. So, Radu, companies. Thank you very much. Maturity, thank cyber you very security. Much, thank you very much, Julian, and thank you, the organizer, for this conference. It's my fifth time when speaking at this conference, and I'm really happy about it. Uh, and I saw it evolving over the, the years. Uh, what Francesca uh, told earlier uh, remind me, I think the this year could be summarized by the fact that resilience and uh, cybersecurity in general should be done only on paper to be tested also as Yaroslav said with their, their cyber drill exercises uh, we've seen that yeah everybody was think are quite prepared for some um, uh, attacks or um, different type of uh, work everybody was uh, let's say uh, um, long the remote uh, working exercise uh, as a day, but in the end, we find out that we're not there. So, speaking about the, the maturity and where are we situated now, I was I remember that last year we were speaking about uh, the four levels of uh, maturity, and we're going towards the risk based approach to to of cybersecurity level, but. Apparently, this year, uh, shake up uh, from the ground everything that we knew and we figure out that indeed, just about uh, doing a paper based risk base, it's about testing it, implementing real measures. And I would go even a step forward to, to say that, in my opinion, um, those cyber drills should not be necessarily uh, one and uh, known by the, by the protecting people. Um, should be also be, let's say, unannounced to really see how the capabilities and the mentality of the, the people uh, protecting the infrastructure are working under that stressful um, crisis situation. Um, and definitely I, can, I, 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 I see now that um, it's the need of going through the process of risk management as thorough as possible, but also targeting th uh, towards uh, proactive cybersecurity, more and more need to see exactly where we be and to, to see a little bit, okay, what's the next step, what's going to happen. And I, th I think that here the collaboration between uh, public and private is more and more uh, important, as definitely there is no one industry or one one type of uh, organization that can say, okay, I can do it uh, alone. I'm uh, for you to tell us about the uh, situation in the Republic of Moldova, if it's possible. You know, I know that you worked extensively there. Uh, Mihai, I mean, Radu was with the connection, the bad connection, I will move to Mihai for the Republic of Moldova, if it's possible, because you have extensive uh, uh, experience in Republic of Moldova. Mihai? Thank you, Ilya. Well, in the last 12 years in Republic of Moldova, I've seen a lot of things. For instance, because you mentioned the laws, I've seen from nothing to the actual law of personal data protection that will be upgraded. It's about nine years old. And even if on the website you can find European legislation as a menu, and there you have GDPR defined as relevant European framework, uh, they still say on the website that the actual law was drawn up to full with the old directive. Uh, and so there is some place to be uh, improved. Uh, we also have government decision uh, to that which is three years old related to minimum mandatory cybersecurity requirements, which it's a good step, but just a step for the process of covering the legislative gap with, uh, compared with the European Union. There are a lot of things 
uh, that needs to be improved. But as Mr. Prime Minister Yun Kiku mentioned, we are positive and we expect for these changes. Okay, I would ask all of you if you can make a, a proposition, a, a phrase which should uh, uh, summarize your idea about the uh, cyber resilience and what needs to be done in the foreseeable future. Um, Yaroslav, you're the first, please. A phrase, cyber resilience. We are calling all stakeholders uh, for strengthening the collaboration and uh, we hope that uh, we will be able in January set the concrete priorities for the action and support of the international organizations like ITU uh, to provide the necessary uh, capacities uh, to the national stakeholders and the regional stakeholders in improving the cybersecurity level at the European level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yaroslav. Really appreciate Anakin. Well, my wish is that um, I think this growing consensus that we need to move from deterrence paradigm into resilience paradigm is knowingly and decisively embraced by by governments, of course, in their on ongoing or further conversations, but then also with this uh, with this real empowerment of uh, different stakeholders to to action that the resilience because it's not eventually diplomats that build resilience or or actually can provide resilience but they can empower uh those activities by other stakeholders okay thank you very much so resilience and deterrence very nice put uh francisca your phrase your take on resilience yeah so my wish would also be for governments um, who will take this seriously to really also invest in this, in, to invest in strategic planning for resilience and then invest in implementing and in incorporating with the relevant stakeholders um, um, and really providing uh, the right level of resilience for um, their whole society. Thank you very much. Radu, hope we have a good connection, please. Radu, a phrase about resilience. What should be our conclusion? I don't think that Radu is hearing us. Mihai, please. I believe that in order to achieve resilience, we need to uh, fix the legislative gap, to change perceptions, uh, and uh, to have more transparency and, of course, to, to invest. Thank you. Oh, that's, that's a good, that's a good uh, final for your conclusion. Investing it comes from the state, it comes from the companies, comes from the societies for all of, from all of us to build uh, resilience. And I will try to get back to Radu if we can hear him. Radu? Could we have your conclusion? I, I think that we've lost Radu somehow in the process. Natalia, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Julian, and thank you all panelists for these great discussions. I hope Radu is with us. You see technology, not only in Moldova, but in Romania also, not far from Moldova. And also, uh, I like the last point that Mihai mentioned, the investment. I think with this, we can start the panel and we can finish, and we are going to continue in 2020 and 2021. Thank you, Julian, and thank you all.